we have uh, two talks and three speakers this um, for the last session. And we're not, it's not going to be terribly AI focused. It's going to be more focused on genomics and the structure of the genome. And the first talk is particularly interesting because when I was taught biochemistry, histones were only found in eukaryotes. It would appear that histones are actually found elsewhere as well now. And um, we're going to hear from Carolyn Luger, who's a professor here in Boulder, about those histones in other organisms apart from eukaryotes. So over to you. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thanks for sticking with us. Um, I know it's almost happy hour, so I'll, make, I'll, I'll try to make this somewhat entertaining, although uh, I have some really hard acts to follow here. <laughs> so um, I'm really thrilled to be one of CU's representatives here. Um, I love it here, uh, and I hope you do, do as well. So we will talk about genomes. No artificial intelligence was hurt in the progress, in the process of making this talk. And because it is late and because we're all ready for happy hour, I just want to give you my three take home points first. I, somebody had a really cool expression for that, which I immediately forgot because I'm old. But my first take home point is, uh, as a resident structural biologist here, that structural biology is really important to understand cells and ultimately organisms. And what do I mean by this? I ride my bike a lot, and I would argue that if you determine the structure of all components of a bicycle, and you had some structures of some sub complexes of your bicycle, you could actually figure out how your bicycle looks like. And from that, you could deduce how the bicycle works. And even more importantly, if the bicycle breaks down, you could figure out how to fix it. And so this is my pitch for structural biology. We really need to understand the structure of the macromolecules in our cells to understand the function of said cells. The second point I want to make is a little bit more biological, if you will. Sorry about the dinner uh, analogy here. You guys are all hungry, probably. And that is that complex genomes uh, are organized in very complex structures. And to get back to my first take home point, it is really important to understand the, uh, the physical structure of the genome to understand functional genomics. And my third pitch is a little uh, more esoteric, if you will. And that is, we should all embrace the weird. Uh, what do I mean by this? I would actually argue that majority of the seminal discoveries in biology come from the study of weird systems and weird organisms and weird phenomena, starting with antibiotics, penicillin, with restriction enzymes, Werner Arbor, of course, our own famous example, ribozymes, uh, genome editing came from the yogurt people, uh, uh, cancer drugs, studies on aging have all their origins in studying non-model organisms, if you will, that then uh, eventually became model organisms. And even if you're BI doesn't allow you to work on weird worms that only grow in an esoteric cave in Wyoming uh, under like uh, sulfuric acid. Um, you should embrace the weird in your data. And I would actually argue that a lot of the seminal discoveries maybe in your lab and in your careers came from something where you yourself or your students said, huh, that's really weird. I can't really explain that. And I think the key of being a good scientist is to know when to kind of burrow a little bit deeper and like, and like not just discard it and say like, well, that's weird, I'll just repeat it and then it'll go away. So um, this is my pitch for the weird. Uh, word of warning, this is not a recipe for success, unfortunately. Uh, and like nine times out of 10, you're gonna just find something weird that nobody else cares about, or it is just some bizarre gel artifact that you can never reproduce. But sometimes you find something really unexpected. And, and, and uh, I think during my career, um, I've, I've encountered this often enough that I will actually embrace it when students show me failed experiments. And I tell them, listen to your experiment. It's trying to talk to you. It's trying to tell you something. It failed and it tells you, get me out of here. I want to talk to you. So, this is my little pitch, so let's get to the science here. And just to uh, state the obvious, uh, as human beings, we are very complex multicellular organisms, and our genomes are very, very large, not only at the functional level, but also in the sheer physical size. 
And an analogy that's often used, although it's kind of silly because nobody uses phone books anymore, but some of you might, may, might remember phone books. You could fill about a thousand-ish phone books with just letters of A, C, G, and T, and that would then be the human genome. And that was really one of the criticisms that was voiced when uh, the vision of decoding the human genome was, uh, was stated originally. How could this be of any use? And we know how that story ended. Now, um, the organization of information in linear form poses many challenges. And, and looking at this room, there's a large number of you who recognize what this is. Uh, <laughs> and, and those of you who don't, this was this really cool thing that you could use to store your music on, and then you could carry it with you. It was amazing. Um, but uh, it came with its challenges, as, you, as many of you have seen your favorite cassette tapes end up like this. But just like um, the, the uh, cassette tape that's used to store, the, the magnetic tape, if you will, that's used to store information, um, Packaging the genome, these vast amounts of an incredibly thin thread into a very small confines of a space has a lot of challenges. And the equivalent is really to package uh, about, the, about uh, 10 miles, 16 kilometers, of a very, very thin, very fragile thread into a golf ball. And if that weren't enough, you need to process the, uh, you, need to, you need to protect the uh, information from physical damage and tangles, because if you're not up your DNA, you get DNA breaks, and that usually call, uh, can cause uh, chromo uh, chromosome breakage and chromosome um, fusions that are aberrant. That's hallmarks of many cancers. You need to also accurately duplicate the genome during cell division. So you have to unzip your cassette tape uh, and faithfully replicate it. And uh, when you think about uh, reading out the genome uh, because, because you need the information that's stored on, you need to find the requisite information and then also copy it faithfully into messenger RNA. And so these are all uh, challenges that um, are really, when you think about it, quite mind-boggling. And um, it is actually known that when any of these things go wrong, this lies at the, at the heart of many uh, cancers because um, you can get mutations. And depending on where those mutations are, that can lead to transformations, um, none of which are good. And so we study uh, the structural organization of the genome. And so just to rephrase my take-home points um, in a little bit of more of a scientific um, way, uh, we'll talk very briefly about the structural biology of chromatin. And I'll use this, um, this opportunity to, to sing the praises of structural biology and what the, me the modern methodology is. And it's really, really come a long way um, since certainly I started in this business. We'll I'll then spend like one slide to talk about the challenges associated with decoding and navigating chromatin. Um, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about the phenomenon of epigenetics, which is kind of always called the X-Files of genetics, because everything that's not easily explainable, we'll say, oh, that's just, that's just epigenetics. So we'll talk a little bit about this. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the weird, and, and I'll take you on our journey of what we discovered when we started looking for the evolutionary origins of chromatin and, and, and who provided this whole chromatin starter kit. And, and I can tell you right away, we do not have the answers yet, but we certainly have a lot of fun searching for it. So, so just to begin here, uh, eukaryotic DNA organization 101, what is in every textbook is that DNA forms a complex with an equal mass of proteins. Um, these proteins are, comp uh, are the four histone proteins um, called H2A, H2B, H3, H4. These terms were, were born in the 1920s or even earlier, just depending on their migration on a gel. Um, and they form little hockey pucks of proteins, and each of, um, uh, each of these hockey pucks organizes about 147 base pairs of DNA. So not very much. And so long uh, beads on a string, uh, arrays of nucleosomes, that's what these structures are called, are then further compacted into higher order structure and further wound up in ways that are not very well, oops, not very well understood. Uh, sorry, just going doing its own thing, not very well understood uh, to, to form uh, regions of chromatin that might be more compressed or less compressed. So uh, 
through the magic of structural biology, we've determined the structure of these nucleosomes. And um, yeah, this is, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm having the same issues as everybody else does. So this is supposed to be a movie, but it's not playing, but that's okay. Um, we've determined the structure of these nucleosomes, and you can actually see, if you saw the whole thing, it would be even more obvious, but you can see it here as well, that the DNA is not really your, your grandma's Watson Crick, kind of nice straight DNA that you can just access and read the basis of, but it's highly contorted, and it's wrapped around this core of histones, and that, uh, that poses a lot of challenges to, uh, to the machinery that ultimately needs to access it. And on the right, you can see the histones uh, in their specific fold, and this will become, this will come back later on. All right, so there's fundamentally two different approaches to, uh, to determine structures. There's X-ray crystallography. That requires the formation of crystals. These crystals are then put on an X-ray beam. Uh, usually we use synchrotron radiation, resulting in this beautiful diffraction pattern. And then through a bunch of mathematical transformations that I won't go into, we can then arrive at so-called electron densities. And so the electrons that are, make up our structures, because structures are made out of atoms, um, they they scatter the x-rays in a specific way, and, and it's almost like you find an envelope of what you're looking at. Now, um, Jesus, I don't know. <laughs> this is not supposed to be automated. All right, so the, the second method that's, uh, be that's become very, very um, uh, prevalent in recent years is cryo-electron microscopy. What we do there, we do not need to form crystals, but rather we embed our molecules in a very thin film of vitreous ice, and so we freeze them very rapidly. These molecules fall into the ice film in every possible orientation, at least that's the idea. And, from, and then we can directly visualize them with an electron microscope. Uh, and this gives rise to, um, you can then average these molecules in, in their different orientations. You can form so-called 2D class averages. And from that, you can directly calculate electron density. So you arrive at the same, um, at the same um, maps, if you will. Um, and so ultimately, the goal is that you, you determine the structure or the position of every atom with respect to every other atom in your, um, in, 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 in your molecule. And um, this, is, uh, this is then what we define as a macromolecular structure. And so you can determine atomic bonds. You can look at water molecules. You can look at drugs. Um, it's really quite, quite amazing, the things you can do uh, once you have these in hand. Now, all the cool kids nowadays use cryo-electron microscopy. It's the method of choice. And the reason for this is uh, because of the so-called resolution revolution in cryo -EM, resulting in the Nobel Prize in 2017, I think, uh, to these three gentlemen here. Um, if you look to the left, you can see the re resolution of macromolecular structures, any random structure before 2013. We we call this affectionately blobology. And so the crystallographers were feeling very smug because cryo-EM just really sucked. You couldn't see any detail. And, and, and now you can actually see these molecules at, um, at atomic resolution, if you will, meaning that you can really observe the details of protein-drug interactions or water molecules or um, anything else you might want to see. And the reason for this resolution revolution were major advances in microscope technology, in cameras and detectors, as well as in software and computing power. Um, again, in recent years, boosted by the awesome power of AlphaFold, where you can actually de novo predict protein structure. I will say, however, and this is uh, my pitch for crystallography, that all of this has been made possible by the, by the, um, thousands and thousands of crystal structures that have been deposited in the protein database for general use. And so we're using these structures to bootstrap up. And so if you hear anybody poo-pooing crystallography saying, well, that's all, all an old hat, um, it's uh, the, the modern advances in structural biology really have been built on, on old-fashioned X-ray crystallography. 
All right, so what's all this talk about resolution? Just to make sure that why, why are we so obsessed about resolution? If you're Alf from planet Melmac and you walk on the street and you find a glove, you find a mitten, you don't really know how my hand looks like. You think it's like a paddle and then it has like a little weird protrusion. Um, if you have higher resolution, maybe like a ski mitten, you can get a pretty good idea. I have like five fingers, but we don't really know how they move. If you get high resolution, maybe around uh, in, in, the, in the order of the bond, where you can resolve bond lengths and things like that, you uh, eventually can deduce how my hand looks like in real life. And from that, uh, you have a much better chance of deducing how my hand actually would work. And so this is why we, as structural biologists, are so obsessed with resolution. So whenever you hear that, um, it's not just a number, it's really what helps you to determine function. Now. Um, uh, here at CU Boulder, um, we, um, we are very accomplished structural biologists, but we didn't have the instrument at hand. And so uh, I spent a lot of energy and pushing and shoving and money raising and hustling to get a, uh, one of these uh, $8 million instruments here on campus. This instrument that we affectionately call Princess Krios, it's a Krios um, because she's very, it's from the princess and the pea, it's very, uh, sensitive. Um, I can tell you the fairy tale after we're done here. Um, this instrument arrived in 2019, uh, just before COVID hit, and then was installed during COVID. It saw first light in 2020, and then uh, first data was collected in, in July 2020. So this really allowed us to, to gain access to the resolution revolution and fully capitalize it on it and it's been truly transformative. And just to show you why I'm so excited about this instrument, this is a map of all of Titan Creoses, these high-end instruments in the entire United States. And you can see that our Princess Creos um, fills a vast geographic area. So there was really like a wasteland in terms of microscopy. And now we've um, managed to fill that wasteland. Uh, our instrument is, is, I'm proud to say, and I'm just gonna brag shamelessly here, the highest performing instrument in the world. Um, it has like 99% uptime. Uh, so it's just a really, really good instrument and very well maintained. I take no credit as our fabulous facilities manager. We have a lot of users already. Uh, we have a lot of industry buy-in um, and it's just been a success all around. And uh, because we are the victims of our own success, we needed a new screening microscope and this is actually being installed next week. So this is like a little sister. We call her the Duchess, um, <laughs> Duchess Glacius. So, so this is what we can do with this instrument. These are structures of nucleosomes, as you can see. Uh, to the left is the electron density, and you can see the exquisite detail. You can see the base pairs. You can actually see amino acids. And to the right is the model that we can build from this. And just, um, as, an, just, just uh, as an example of the power of this methodology, it took me about eight years of my life to determine the crystal structure of this very same structure uh, by X-ray crystallography. Uh, now we have second year grad students doing it in two months. So this is, this is good, this is progress. Uh, I have no idea where this is going to go, but uh, we're super excited to have this technology here on campus. All right, so um, how do we decode and navigate chromatin? And just to exemplify to you, and, and just a, a, a spoiler alert, there's some really complicated machinery is required to get at the DNA that is thus wrapped around these protein spools. And this is intuitively obvious from this little diagram here. In order to transcribe DNA or replicate DNA, you need to split it apart, you need to unzipper it. It's a double helix. This in and of itself is already difficult because you have all kinds of torsional issues. And then if you think about it, with these cute little crochet nucleosomes, uh, if you think about it, if they're wrapped around uh, these histones to make nucleosomes, this is uh, really, uh, even harder, so it's really not a small deal to, to access uh, chromatin um, in, in this context. So uh, the complicated machinery um, is twofold. When a polymerase races towards uh, nucleosomal DNA, something's gotta give. Uh, the histones have to be evicted. And because histones are very sticky proteins, they have to be chaperoned somehow. Um, we have, to, uh, we have to stabilize a partially disassembled nucleosome so, the, so that they don't break apart completely. 
and we also have to reassemble the nucleosomes in the wake of the polymerase. This is really important because this will prevent what we call cryptic transcription initiation where polymerases might think, oh, this is a really good promoter, why don't I go and make a, a cryptic transcript from there, even though it shouldn't be making a transcript from, from, that, from, the, from that particular DNA region. Uh, so these, these jobs of, um, of um, navigating through chromatin falls into the hands of two different classes of proteins. One is histone chaperones. These are exactly what you think they are. They're like the chaperones at a high school dance. They prevent hanky-panky between partners that they shouldn't be, so histones should not interact with RNA. They shouldn't interact with DNA when, 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 they're, when it's not until it's ready to be interacted with. Um, and then we also have ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers. These are big SUVs of machines utilizing a vast amount of ATP to kind of push DNA and move, uh, and liberate the DNA and remove the histones temporarily. And we use structural biology to determine structures of, of several of these complexes. To the right, you just see an example. I don't want to go into the details here. You just see an example of one that's an ATP-dependent chromatin remodeler that uses ATP hydrolysis to push the DNA down and thereby moving sliding nucleosomes along the DNA, freeing up DNA fragments. And to the right, you see a, um, a nucleosome um, that's bound to a histone chaperone. And the function of this, um, of this protein is to kind of, I don't think it's, ah, it's going to do it. The function of this protein is to just find nucleosomes that are partially dismembered and feeling a little sick and need some tender loving care. And so it just sits on them and it hugs them and makes them whole again until uh, they can be reassembled into functional nucleosomes. All right, so we're kicking the can down the road. How do these factors know where to go in the genome to do their job? And this is largely defined as the area of epigenetics, meaning above, literally meaning above, above genetics. And this is signaling through chromatin. And so there's several epigenetic mechanisms at work in, in um, human cells and actually in all eukaryotic cells. Many of these uh, are actually when they go awry, uh, cause severe disease. Um, there are RNA-based mechanisms. There are DNA, there's DNA methylation. And there's also histone modifications, and especially the latter ones. Uh, uh, these, are, these are small chemical modifications that decorate the histones and kind of signal to the machinery to, to, to come bind there. And for example, the chromatin remodeling factors to come bind there and um, do their business. So um, where on the histones are these epigenetic modifications? And I, I want to point out that the histone proteins themselves are structurally and functionally bipartite, meaning that they have a structured region that is responsible for bending DNA into this rather extreme shape. And then they have these little decorations, these dangly bits at the end. And these are the regions where proteins come in and then put these post-translational modifications on to signal to chromatin. And uh, so, so this has often been referred to as the histone code. Uh, these are combinations, many combinations of small chemical modifications that then recruit other machinery through chemical interactions. Um, and, and just like for any code, you need readers, you need writers and erasers, and there's a plethora of these in human cells, and many of these are actually drug targets um, and are used to, to treat especially um, cancer. But, um, for, from, from my point of view, so there's a lot of research going on in this, and some of it is done in my lab, but uh, I, I got really interested in, in uh, the provenance, who invented this machinery. And if you look across the whole eukaryotic domain of life in all its diversity, and we've seen a little bit of that with flatworms and sea stars and all kinds of interesting things, and single cell organisms that we didn't really talk about, the histones, the histone code, and the complicated chromatin maintenance machinery is highly conserved across the entire domain of eukaryotes. And this begs the question, who provided this chromatin starter kit? So arguably, this was a very, very early um, event during the evolution of eukaryotes, and arguably also it allowed us 
uh, it, it provided for this massive expansion of the genome that characterizes the majority of eukaryotes because most bacteria have genomes that are radically smaller than that of eukaryotes. And so it must have been a very early event. And furthermore, once this was set in stone, it really didn't evolve all that much. And because there's not that many differences between uh, Giardia lambda, this really happy, um, this really happy looking purple thing there that causes, as some of you may know, who knows what beaver fever? Yes, if you've had it, you know it. Uh, <laughs> that's why we don't drink from streams uh, here in Colorado a very nasty intestinal uh, parasite. Uh, but these guys, as primitive, arguably, as they are, they have the complete machinery. Everything's already there. And so we decided to go look in for histones, look for the origins of this, of this whole apparatus in domains of life that arguably have contributed to eukaryotes. And so just, just to remind everybody, there's a couple of hypotheses of how eukaryotes have acquired their nucleus and their cell membrane. And the most prevalent one is that an enterprising archaeon from the domain of archaebacteria ate a very small probacterium. The probacterium became the mitochondrion. The archaeon then became the nucleus. And then there might have been an additional um, and an additional bacterial symbiosis event. Um, nobody was there, so we don't really know. Um, and then there was a lot of uh, genome exchange uh, with viruses. So we decided to look for histones in everybody who might have possibly contributed to the LECA, to the original, to the uh, first eukaryotic ancestor. And the first system that caught our attention were viruses, and in particular, giant viruses. Now, before you freak out, giant viruses, uh, that's the last thing we need right now, right? It's another virus, let alone a giant one. These mostly infect aquatic life, single cell aquatic life, like amoeba, so there are no health concern. They are huge. They are almost as big as bacteria, which is why they haven't really been discovered until late 2000s, because, uh, because they, they didn't pass through these filtration devices that were used to distinguish them from bacteria. They are really large because unlike our viruses that have very specific um, systems to dock onto cell receptors and trick the cell into, into taking them up, they just pretend to be bacteria. And so the amoeba swims along and thinks, oh, there's a yummy bacterium to eat, and eats it, and then the rest of it is history. So uh, in particular, um, they're, they're also thought to be very deep branching during evolution, which is why we were interested. And in particular, this subgroup of Mercedes-Ridae and a uh, model organism, Melbourne virus, um, caught our attention because it actually encodes histones, which is super weird. So these histones are fused as doublets, and, um, and, and then that's really not that important for you guys because you're not nucleosome people. And by and large, they're really very distantly related to the eukaryotic histones, um, which, which, as I told you already, are almost invariant among eukaryotes. So here we only have 22 to 27 percent identity. Um, so we decided to check whether we could make these into nucleosomes and whether we what if, if we can, what these structures would look like. And so this is a structure of this viral nucleosome. And it kind of sort of looks like a nucleosome with some really interesting wrinkles. Uh, and so I'll just summarize those for you. And um, the, ma the main differences that we observed here is that they're quite unstable. And uh, the connectors that they use that eukaryotes don't have are actually used for structural purposes. And so they, they really have, are quite divergent from what we, are, what we know from in eukaryotes. And also that charge distribution seems to be very different. They are much less charged, meaning these nucleosomes bind DNA less tightly. They're more unstable. And you can see this in this charge representation. So the bluer something is in a surface, the more basically charged it is, and the better a surface it is for the, his, for, for the DNA to bind to, which is, of course, because of its phosphate backbone, very acidic. These histones are very, very abundant in the mature virus. They are almost more abundant than the main coat protein, the main uh, capsid protein. And when you do some fancy math, you can actually see that there is enough viral histones to package the entire viral genome. And so we believe that these really are used in the virus capsid to organize the viral DNA. But like, why? And why 
do we need this for survival? And so in order to, to answer this question, let's look at the life cycle of this virus. Like I told you, this thing pretends to be a bacterium. It gets eaten by the amoeba. Um, it then rapidly establishes a viral factory in the cytoplasm. It never goes into the nucleus. It softens up the nucleus somehow. Polymerases leak out. These host polymerases are used to transcribe the DNA, to replicate the DNA. Histones are made. And rather than going into the uh, back into the uh, amoeba nucleus, they go back into the viral um, factory uh, by a mechanism that we don't understand and then are packaged into the viral cap capsid to organize the DNA there. The amoeba dies a horrible death. Free, uh, a lot of progeny virus is released and then um, the cycle starts over again. And so this thing never enters the cell nucleus and uh, we wanted to find out whether the virus needs these histones, and if yes, what for? And so our collaborators and friends managed to make a virus that had the histone genes deleted, and these things are very rapidly outcompeted by wild-type virus. Um, but if you transiently transfect the amoeba with viral histones, then the virus actually, uh, the mutant virus can live because it can use uh, these transient transiently transfected viral histones to package its genome. So it seems to be that uh, these histones are absolutely needed for viral fitness and infectivity. Um, now, uh, to summarize, I've shown you that, uh, that uh, they form nucleosomes with uh, dis distinct structural features. They localize to the viral factory. They're required for viral fit fitness, and, and we're in the process of figuring out at what process they really, uh, for what they really need them. Now, going forward, we think this is a really cool minimalist system to figure out how nucleosomes are assembled and how they're navigated, because the virus doesn't, probably doesn't have any of that machinery. We're looking for this minimalist machinery in the viral genome, and Interestingly, about 60% of the genome of these guys is dark, meaning we have no idea what these open reading frames actually encode. And so we think we'll find a lot of really cool stuff there. And then we're also interested in, in figuring out how general a phenomenon this might be. And um, it turns out that uh, giant virus genomes are discovered at a rapid rate. And uh, a recent publication showed that especially samples uh, from permafrost, so 30,000-year-old samples, are particularly enriched in these giant viruses. There was even an article in CNN about the zombie virus. They could revive one of them. Uh, and so we're really interested in looking at these ancient samples to see what we could find there. We've started on this already with a virus that's called Medusa virus. It's, it's called, am I done? Okay. Five minutes before. So Medusa virus is, um, turns its host to stone, uh, apparently it insists it, and so uh, we, we solved the structure of that, and we really have a lot of fun poking around there. And uh, this virus is particularly interesting because it exchanges, uh, it's thought to have exchanged genome with uh, LECA, with the uh, first eukaryotic ancestor. So. The provenance of these viral histones is really, um, is, is really not clear who got what from whom, but it's pretty established that archaea, which encodes single minimalist histones with no tails, just a single histone, were the, probably the, the most parsimonious donators of histones in eukaryotes. And so a while ago, we determined the structure of archaeal nucleosomes, and it turns out that this single simple histone can make nucleosomes that almost look the same as eukaryotic nucleosomes, except for they just keep going, just keep going around and around and around. They make so-called endless hypernucleosomes, if you will. Um, we then later showed that these nucleosomes open and close stochastically in the cell. We've shown this by cryo-EM, and we think uh, this really provides a very nifty way uh, to, to open, to, to uh, provide access to the genome um, in absence of any of the uh, remodeling factors. Uh, we don't, th there's no remodeling factors in archaea. So um, let me just skip this because I'm running a little late. So, Intriguingly, uh, this, this hypernucleosome system seems to have been retained at the ends of human chromosomes as well. And this was shown by Daniela Rhodes a while ago. And you can see at telomeres where, that have very, very 
tight, tightly spaced nucleosomes, these also form these hypernucleosome structures that can also open stochastically. And if you remove the histones and just superimpose the DNA, you'll see this almost ridiculous uh, correspondence of this. And so this is a really cool evolutionary link, almost like they retained this ancient ability to form these hypernucleosomes at telomeres. Uh, back to archaea, we're interested in to seeing how common a phenomenon this is. Uh, and I just want to remind me, you that archaea inhabit really diverse uh, niches of life. Every single niche of life is inhabited by archaea. They encounter very weird conditions, and so we're really interested to see how, um, how, um, how they adapt to these different environments. Uh, now, uh, let me not belabor the point here, but we still do not know where the missing link is. So we have archaea, we have the giant viruses, we have the eukaryotes. We still don't know where the missing link is. And so we went to the last histone holdout to bacteria. It's widely been thought, and every textbook says it, no histones in bacteria. They use other proteins. And so uh, there was a little pandemic that happened, and everybody had a lot of time to genome gaze. And so our collaborators in the Warnecke lab uh, looked at the, uh, looked at, uh, scoured the entire, arche uh, entire bacterial domain for histone genes. And indeed, they found that in about 2% of the genomes, there, there is histone-like proteins. And we focused on one uh, particular class of uh, bacteria, the, the Dello Vibrio, uh, Bacteria Voros. And if you speak Latin, you know this name means bacterium eating. In fact, this guy is a predator with a really interesting lifestyle. Um, it swims around in its attack phase, finds itself a juicy E. coli, burrows itself into the outer membrane, sits in the periplasmic area, is protected from the environment, is protected from the bacterium, secretes a lot of nucleases, lipases, proteases into the host, digests that from the outside, the nutrients leak out, and it uses that to grow and uh, multiply and then dies a horrible death. So, as a small genome size, uh, as a small, a small overall size, but it has a large genome, and it has a single and very highly expressed histone. And just to exemplify why we think this is such a cool organism, uh, this is a video that's been recently published, if I can get it to run. Oof, go. Okay, so this is a host cell being infected by Abdello Vibrio. It multiplies and it literally eats up the host and then boom, just explodes it. So this thing is actually explored as a last resort antibiotic. It's, it's really cool, right? How can you not work on this? So, <laughs> so uh, this histone is, is highly abundant, as shown by, uh, by quantitative mass spectrometry. We solved the crystal structure of this protein. It looks like a histone. If you compare it to the archaeal histone, it's a little different, but also very similar. So I don't want to belabor the detail. It's a little more squat, and it's a, but it pretty much looks like a histone to all practical purposes. It has a really nice basic DNA binding surface that in archaea and in eukaryotic histones is used to bind the DNA across it in this really nice arc. And so it looks like a histone, it walks like a histone, it quacks like a histone, but it doesn't bind DNA like a histone. It actually binds DNA end on, which is super weird, despite the fact that it has a really nice surface to do this. So what's going on here? In the crystal lattice, this thing actually, rather than wrapping DNA around its outside, it wraps itself around the DNA by doing this. So it forms a nucleohistone filament, completely covering the DNA. Every single phosphate is coated by this histone, completely covered, as you can see in this, in this little movie here. Um, there's really no way anybody can access this DNA. The DNA is completely buried on the inside. And I'll just skip this because I'm running out of time. We can uh, do simulations. This thing, in MD simulations, this thing is pretty stable. And then just for giggles, if we pretend it's a normal histone, it really doesn't behave like a normal histone. It just, boom, falls apart. So the thing at the bottom is the bacterial histone. We try to force it to be like a normal guy doesn't want to do it, falls apart. So we have a situation where we have um, an inside out, we completely reverse histone logic. We have a histone that exists in bacteria where it shouldn't exist. We have, um, it binds, it wraps itself around the outside of the DNA rather than the other way around like every decent histone should. And um, 
And so we were really interested to see whether this thing exists in the cell. And there's, a, there's some data that, yes, it does. Um, and that is that the, the bacterial genome is completely inaccessible during the attack phase, even to small molecule. This is work shown by others. And we could show that this histone is really uh, abundantly associated with a bacterial nucleate all over the place. I'm almost done. No, it's done. Okay, so let's skip the tomography because it really doesn't show us very much quite yet. I just wanted to show off. Um, and, and I just wanted to speculate, like, why does this guy need this thing? And there's a couple of um, speculations. First of all, <clears throat> this thing is, is 20 times large, smaller than E. coli, but the genome is almost the same, so arguably you need some compaction. Um, you might need to protect your genome as you're doing your nefarious business of, of injecting the host, the prey cell, with all these nucleases. Or you might actually need to line up your genome in a linear fashion in order to, um, to, to then divide it up into equal chunks. So uh, we're really interested in, in following up on this, and, and there's a lot of ongoing work in the lab, but I think just on a general uh, on a general uh, note, um, uh, this is being used as a last resort antibiotic, or at least being explored, and it really represents a paradigm shift um, for uh, for uh, our the way we think about histones in general. And uh, I just want to like finish with my pitch of unprecedented insights really come often out of out of left field. So I've, I've populated the entire tree of life with histones, and we, there's a lot more there. Uh, and so we just scratched the surface. And so I just want to end with acknowledgments, people in the lab um, who did this work, and then funding, especially from HHMI, because NIH doesn't really like this kind of research. And so I'm very grateful to funders that let us do the kinds of weird things that uh, nobody is interested until you find something interesting. And then it's kind of too late. OK, thank you very much. Sorry for going over. Okay, so we've got time for a couple of questions. Who would like to start? There's one. That was simply astounding, Catalan. Uh, quick question, which is, um, you know, when you're, these viruses are producing their histones in, uh, in, a, in an amoeba, uh, the structure of DNA is conserved right, uh, from, <laughs> from bacteria to, to humans. So wh what prevents the the viruses' histones from assembling and going and binding the amoeba's DNA? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we actually uh, see them going into the nucleus a little, and then they just go out again. So there's something in there. Maybe the assembly machinery doesn't recognize them. And that's something that we're actively looking at. It's a really good question. Any more for any more? OK, well, it was stunning. Good. Lovely pictures. Thank you.